that CT tools and how we use them. What we're going to do for the next three hours is we're going to analyze a couple of different things. The first thing we're going to do is talk about the tools briefly. Then we are going to go through learning styles. And then we're going to talk about the seven principles of good teaching. The schedule for today, we'll start off with just brief introductions. For those of you who don't know me, I think everyone in this room does know me, but my name is Darren Cannell. I am the assistant principal for the Saskatoon Catholic Cyber School, and this three-hour presentation will be based on what you see up here on the overhead. Uh, what I would like to do now is just speaking to me, act like the camera's not here, just tell me who you are, what your role is here in the uh, school, so that each one of us can uh, know what everyone else is doing in this room. Starting with Tony, you can go first. My name is Tony Antonopoulos, and uh, <coughs> presently I am involved in teaching the Physics 30 program in cyber school. Uh, we went through the first uh, part of the program in, in the first semester, that's done. And we're in the process now of registering students for the second semester. And I'm also uh, working on developing the Physics 20 program for cyber school <coughs> to come online in September. Thank you. David. David Elder. Teacher of physical education, mathematics, uh, wrote, still writing, mathematics 90 online, being prepared to, uh, to offer it to grade nines, grade eights that are out there, homeschool kids, right away this week. Gerard, you're next. Okay. My name is Gerard Point. I'm uh, new to cyber school. I'm here to write calculus 30A, um, high school level. In previous assignments, I've worked on computing as well as math uh, and uh, English. Thank you. Mr. Pilon. Uh, Kevin Pilon, uh, currently developing curriculum for math 20, and this is uh, my first attempt at that's Thank you. Sheila. My name is Sheila Lesko. I'm actually a CDI uh, college graduate. Um, I'm here working weeks of uh, work intern, and I will be trying to help with the uh, database for the students of the Sorry, Carlson. <laughs> uh, I'm Carlson Cordes-Davis on the other half of the CDI workplace right here. Um, uh, she's a in building a database and also uh, programming an interface to interact with <coughs> Ruth? My name is Ruth Byers. I'm the Secretary of Holy Cross My name is Ken Hodson. I was one of the original four to get this going development-wise. I developed an English 30 course uh, last year and taught it for the first time this past semester and then getting ready to teach it again in two days. Okay. The next uh, portion that we're going to go into here is I would like to talk about some of the WebCT tools. But in order to do that, we're going to do it in a different fashion than what you would normally expect. Up here on the counter, I have a total of 11 different tools. Those were just chosen at random from the list that we have of WebCT tools within our courses. Each one of you is going to come up and you're going to choose one of these tools. That's going to be your tool for the day. You're going to become this tool. So everything we do, if I decide to be the glossary person, everything we do is going to be based on me being the glossary tool and how I would apply it. Good teaching practices, learning styles, positive and minus things about this, and interesting things about this tool. So I'm going to ask you to come up, just ladies first, of course, come up, help yourself, uh, choose uh, a tool, then head back to your seats, and then I'll bring the guy up. All the good ones are gone by the time we get up there. So. Movie guy, you're next. <laughs> Movie guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Is it going to be a flash? Is it going to be a flash? Once you get into the home page, I think most of you have gotten past the front page, you need to click on the 1 to the 115 page. 1 to 115, 145. Yes. Sorry, what is it? 1 to 145? Hang on. Yeah. A laptop will take a little while to fire up there. You'll see in front of you a whole list of different tools. You have yours on that list. If you're not too sure and you've never used this tool before, you may want to click on it. Now, some of them will be active, some of them will have nothing in them. Now, just once you've done that, then I would like you to go back to that home page with all the tools on it. And we're going to work through these tools using what's called a PMI. Now, I'll wait until everyone gets to the back to the home page briefly. With all the icons on it? Yeah. Sorry, Ruth, what's up? Okay, I'll be with you in two seconds. Does the app like have to load every time I want to load it? It should stay. Okay, once you're back on the home page. Are you talking about the home page with the with all the icons on it? You just welcome to the seminar or? Yep. No, this one here. <coughs> That's the one with all the icons. So click on that one. Yeah, okay. So you should have all of the uh, different icons of all the different uh, applications that we're going to use today. And then I'm going to explain to you, once you've got there, stop clicking, look up front here, and I want to explain something to you. The first thing that I'm going to get you to do, how many people here have used the discussion board before? The bulletin board? Yeah. Okay. So if you have not used the bulletin board before, there is an icon on that page called the bulletin board. We need to use that because that's going to be our recording technique for this whole seminar. So click on the icon that says discussion or bulletin boards. That name has changed now, it's the discussion board. Now, what that'll do is it'll send you into the discussion area. You are going to enter a discussion area that will be your tool name. So you have to compose a message. At the top, you'll see a little icon that says Compose Message. Now, we're all working in exactly the same area here, so this may take a little while to load up. But as it loads up, in there, the first thing you're going to write down is the name of your tool. So if I'm presentations, I would write down students' presentations as, the, as a title for my message that I'm going to record. Under subject? Yep, under subject. Now, actually, once you have that written in, then what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about the positive and the minus and the interesting things. I'm going to give you five minutes to write down the, as many positive things as you can possibly think of for presentation tools. So if I'm doing the presentation tools, I would get into the discussion area and I would start writing, I think it's great because all the students can work as a group. I think it's great because uh, the students then have a bulletin board area set up for themselves. They'll have an email group put together where they can exchange information. So you start to just plug information in there. So. Is anyone having a problem getting the discussion area up and running? The first one you're going to do is all the positive things. 
Bert, did you get up and running there? Okay. Okay, thank you. Stopwatch moving. Write down everything positive you can think of for your tool. Guys, have two minutes. Want us to go into the interesting? No, just okay. do positive first. Positive okay. will be all by itself. Down to one minute. Okay, finish the sentence you're working on. Now, at the very top of that, as shown up here, now that I've got my laptop up and running, you can see where I've written down student presentations here. Right next to that, I'm in brackets, I'd like you to write positive. Okay, so student presentations, brackets, positive. subject area right here, student presentations in bracket, write positive. And then you're going to post that. So let's see if we can blow this server right out of the water. Everybody hit post at the same time. Let's see how secure our system is. Or a telephone call.
Okay. For your information, just so you can see how that works, I'll post mine. So we hit post. Then go back and click on home, tools, discussion areas one more time. And then you should have 10 messages up there. There's 10 in this room. We have all posted our own tools. Now, if you'd like to take a look at that, they're all under the main area. So click on main. And as you click on main, you'll notice that each one of our tools will come up. information underneath your tools by replying to that message. Now, the way you do that is you take, this is not mine, mine's the, uh, just have to scroll down here for a second, I'll show you where mine is. If I'm responding to my students' presentations, I would click on that and it would come up with my message. Now, I'm going to reply to that. What we've done is what's called the P in the PMI. We've done the positive things about our tool. The next thing we're going to do is the negative things or the minus things about our tools. And you're going to do that by hitting reply on your message. Okay, so you click right on there and you would respond to. So I go to mine. Yeah, you go to your tool and then hit reply and it should come up. And now you've got five minutes to write down the negative things or the minus things about it. Negative things about mail. Anyone confused as to what we're doing here? We're just building a data bank of the different tools and what is positive and what is negative. What is the interesting about that? So now you need to write all the negative things about mail. Can I change the positive to negative now? No, this will come up as a reply. In your reply, you will put it to negative, correct? Oh, you have no choice. This will just respond directly to it. So the next layer you always know is a negative one. When you post a reply, you'll notice that you don't get a subject area because this will build a ladder. So in here, you may want to place in here that these are the negative points at the very top of your message, just so you can keep them straight. because we're going to respond to each one of your statements. Two minutes. <laughs> Be creative, you guys. Brainstorming. There's no such thing as a bad answer. So throw it down. Whatever you think may apply, 
and then we will respond to it later. If it doesn't apply, it doesn't apply. the tool, then we have all the minus things or the negative things about the tools. The next thing is the interesting thing about the tools. Now, everyone finds this one to be really difficult to do. What you have to do is try to be very creative. Look at this from a point of view as if I could change this tool, if I could make this tool something that it may not be, then that may come under interesting. For instance, if I was doing the student presentation, it would be really nice as if within this tool, I could know when my partners that are working in the presentation area have helped add something to the presentation I'm going to do. So if I'm working with Sheila, for instance, and we're doing a presentation together, it would be really interesting if in this tool it would tell me Sheila has updated the page. Because if Sheila and I are not in the same province or not in the same location, then she would end up having to send me an external email to update or to tell me that things have been updated. So think of something interesting. Push your creative mind here a little bit and see if you can come up with something that's interesting about the tool that you're working on. You have five minutes. Go. Now, once you have posted that, you're going to reply to the first message again. So you're replying to the chat positive. Now this one here, again, you have to put the fact that it's interesting across the top. you're working, I'm just going to talk in the background, so if you hear me, that's great. If not, then just tune me out and try and concentrate on what you're working on. When you're doing the interesting part, try to remember some of the things that we discussed in the pod. If you have been sitting in there, some of you developers, for a long period of time, we've done a lot of brainstorming about how you can use these different tools and what might be interesting in each one of them and how we can use them. It doesn't necessarily have to be to your subject matter. 
So if you are a math person, all your interesting things don't necessarily have to pertain to that subject matter. Because what we're doing here is we're building a data bank of tools that we can use for any developers that come in and sit down in front of the computer and get into that discussion area. They can look at the positive things, both well, the negative things and the interesting things. Seconds and time. Posts. And as these post up, refresh your page. Simply go back to the top and discussions. back to this page. You've got 25 up there. You hit main. Now we do the interesting part. The way this works is like this. You are going to have five minutes to cruise through all the other tools that are there. Some of us have favorite tools that we're used to using if, we're, if you are one of the developers. If you've never used WebCT before and you're new to it, then try to think of one that you may have used on the internet, the chat room or something along that line, so you may have some experience in, and you're gonna spend five minutes adding to that person's tool. So now you can respond to someone else's tools. So you go in there and you look, and if I really like the Jay, nail, you know then I would go into well. Kevin Pilon's area, and I would click on that, and I would reply to his positive, his negative, or his interesting message. And we know the tier now. The first one would be positive. The one below that is going to be your minus. And the one below that is going to be your interesting. So you know which order they go in. So choose whichever one you'd like to and respond to it. You have five minutes. Okay, how come uh, online only the two of them show up?
One minute left. Fresh rates on your computers are a little slow, so you may not be getting all the postings right away, but they do appear in time, as you'll notice on my laptop, which is a, a newer generation machine, tends to bring them up pretty quickly. Okay, next step. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at each one of these tools very quickly. It's going to be like a three minutes for each one of them, approximately. So we're just going to click through each one. The whiteboard is the first one that we're going to look at. And starting with Ken Hodgson, if you have anything that you would like to add, who's our fastest type of typer here? That's Ruth. Ruth, can you help record a little bit for these, please? If someone comes up with something that uh, is positive, can you just hit the reply? So click on Ken Hodgson's, okay. and I'll set you up for this. Click on Ken Hodgson's, the positive. Okay. And then as a group, Try not to read everybody else's. Try to look up here and let's talk about the whiteboard for a second. So when you're dealing with the whiteboard, the whiteboard is an image-based tool. Some of the positive things about it, you can combine text and diagrams according to Mr. Hudson. It is immediately, it is immediate, excuse me, it can be three hands. A step further than chat, good for math and science, allows for interaction between students and teachers. Is there anything else you can think of that may apply to a whiteboard? That may make a whiteboard something that is a very positive thing to use? Is there any places where you've used them in your courses if you've actually been online teaching or things that you may want to use? Any suggestions? I would say it's still a quick way to put something about a student. 
out in trouble, they can they can ask one on one, and then you can show them that he's talking to them. Okay. Yeah, it's just a hit reply, and then you can enter something. He's got all that here allows for interaction. Um, perhaps he has the allows for allows for instantaneous interaction, like a moment, like that moment. Okay. Real time. Real time. Yeah. A few things that I've used this for, typing test. I want to see how quickly a student can type and whether or not they're making a lot of mistakes as they're typing, I bring them right into the whiteboard. Now, you can do the same thing in the chat room, but the whiteboard tends to be fairly handy for that. I've also used it for things, for instance, if I'm running into a technical problem with a student. A student who is having a problem just running through uh, Netscape, I will run a screen capture. Because it's an image-based tool, I can show them the toolbar. I can actually post that to them, saying here's a toolbar, and then you can click on the button that will make that, that toolbar work for them. So you should be hitting the back button here, and then I point to the back button right inside um, the whiteboard and circle it in bright red so that they know what I'm talking about. Where a lot of times when you're sitting on the phone or you're in the chat room, you say, oh yeah, I know the top, the button in the top left-hand corner that has back written on, and students get lost. So this is a very good method of helping a student out when they run into problems. Now, negative and interesting, we will read on our own time. So then when you have time, you will still have access to this later on, so you take a look at that. The second one we're going to look at here is the glossary. It's from Sheila. She says it gives answers to problems, explains gray areas, helps the user interact with areas that are foreign to them, helps explain words that are foreign, helps guide the user. Any other suggestions? I have a question. And it was? Uh, Off the top of your head. Uh, immediate. Instant definitions allows for afterward. Is it possible inside a glossary to give a link to a web page? I think it is. Yeah. I would Definitely. Do you think there are other <coughs> So instead of taking standard uh, definitions that you get out of a dictionary or a text, as a teacher you can design your own definitions or uh, provide an explanation of what the uh, definition is all about? Perfect. What he stated was that you can personalize it. You can make that glossary definition something that just pertains to you as a teacher and those students as students. So you don't necessarily have to link to a dictionary, very cold type definition. As an example, I, I had a definition for computer chips. And my definition was it's something you eat while you're programming your computer. So it's not a, a very serious definition, but the students actually then will go back to your glossary and use it once in a while. If you put the odd joke here and there, and it's not this dry, cold dictionary. So you have to put some of your personality into your glossaries to make them interact. So the science of students can help us out. So the definition of the to the explanations that you explain it to, you explain it to? Excellent, definitely. Plus you can give uh, examples for a definition from the course. But in English that, that helps. Anything else? Okay. So try to keep on schedule here, we'll move on to the next one. Gerard the point. We have Discussions, positive messages can be posted for the entire class to deal with. Information about school setting and timelines can be given here. A teacher can let students know times when he or she is available for chat or for whiteboard work. Effective tool for getting any messages to a large group of people. Good for selling excess stuff. You're, you're going to start selling stuff on my <laughs> It is a very good tool for that. Is there anything else that people have used the discussion board for? I know, Tony, you use it fairly extensively. With well, I use it to, uh, to expand on a particular idea where you may pose a question and then give the students an opportunity to respond to it. And you just keep on expanding on that idea. And then you can come back and pose further questions and just keep the discussion going indefinitely if you really want to. Good point, yes. Student responses uh, are generally very well thought out because they have time to prepare a response to a question. And the discussion will take place over perhaps a week, but you get some real quality answers. So the 
quality answers that you get in a discussion board, would you get the same quality answers in a chat room or over a phone or in a classroom? No, simply because usually a student response, if it's, if it's an instantaneous response, I mean, the, the concept might be there, but the, the answer itself isn't as well thought out. What are some of the other things that you might do inside a discussion board? I know, Ken, you had something going to one day, or something about role playing, where you asked the student to be Shakespeare, for instance, when they're Yeah, there are so many different things you can do. Uh, role playing, as where they take on an identity, and be that person within a discussion board. And that work well. One question that we have run across, and just general information here, if you are watching a discussion develop, what happens when a teacher enters into the discussion? It ends. Okay. It ends. One of the things that I've found, and as he stated at the back here, when a teacher enters into a discussion, quite often, unless you have some rapport with the students and you, they know you may not always have the answer, they automatically assume what you say is the end all, and then they stop talking about it. So if you're talking about nuclear fusion, I think nuclear fusion is the splitting of da 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 and the students go, oh, there's the answer, and then they quit responding. So it's important that you build a rapport with the students. Now, building a rapport in this tool may not happen, but some of the other tools you can certainly use to build rapport with the students. You can in here as well, asking a question at the end of your response. For instance, if I say nuclear fusion is done by da 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 does anyone else think this is true? Because what I stated may be true or it may not, and then let the students continue on the discussion. So it's very important how you formulate your answers in your discussion. I think what you need to do, if I can just add to this, if you're going to do this, you're trying to carry out, uh, I guess, a conversation on a development idea. Uh, as a teacher, you may want to back off. Instead of providing information to them, just keep asking questions. Just draw more information out of the students then go back and get information. That, that, that I found really well. Excellent point. Play the devil's advocate. Just keep asking more questions. Student tips. This one was by Allison. Positive. It guides the students. Helps the students to understand how to use the programs. Helps to diffuse confusion. Students don't have to second guess how to use something. Help instructors. He knows things have been the right way. Have been done the right way. Thank you. So then the uh, the positive tips. Everyone realizes what the tips do when you come to the home page. These pop up. Okay. So you come back to the home page. These tips will just pop up. Now the problem, or the thing that I've run into problems with it is, is controlling what order they come up in and when they come up. So they're not like a glossary definition where you can actually link it to an aspect of your course. It just randomly generates. So when you're thinking about the student tips, it is great for guiding the students, but it's not good for guiding the student if you're on page 18 in order to know how to do the assignment on page 18, you need to know da 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 da. It doesn't work that way. What it does is it will just give up general information or tips for the student when they come back to the home page. However, very positive tool because simple things like we are in a Catholic school. So having your daily quotes or a quote that pertains to the fact that we are Catholic and the way we should proceed in our life. So <laughs> light tips office, end up coming across there. Little jokes for them so that they actually look forward to them appearing. So putting in jokes in that area is another way to entertain the students and keep the students interested. And then general overall ideas in your course. Now, does anyone have anything else that they might have used the tips for? I know it's something that we haven't got into a lot in our courses yet, but it is something that can use very effectively within your courses. And that's why I manipulated that conversation and <laughs> threw my stuff out because I know most of you hadn't gotten around to that point. Well, I think now that we're starting to get some feedback from students that have come to the course, some of the suggestions we come up with, and we can certainly incorporate those suggestions into the student development. That would be an excellent idea. What he just stated was that if you can, we've gone through one semester, so we have some information now from students that say, it would be really nice if I didn't procrastinate because I got caught with all the stuff at the end. That might be a quote that if you ask that student, can I use that quote? So-and-so states that don't procrastinate or you'll end up doing everything at the very end. That may be a student tip that comes up just randomly in the course. 
So something along that line, so they, made, they made a whole pile of great comments in our survey, our year-end uh, survey. They gave us all sorts of great suggestions, and all through the course they gave us suggestions. Ask permission from the student if you can use that and then incorporate it in your course. It will add a lot to your course. Darren, is it image-based? Because I know it's been an interesting point for Allison. She said something about the device that you can add a little color. Yes. It is image-based? Yes, it's, it'll right? take an HTML page. It will do it, yeah. Darren, one question about the tips. Can they be uh, sent out in blocks? So we've, the way a lot of the kids are running the courses, kids are more or less in the same point as the semester goes. So can I say I'm going to release this bunch of tips now, take them back, release this bunch next month, yes. take them back? You can do it that way, but then what you end up having to do, rather than building just one huge data bank of tips, what you have to do is you build a set of them, and then, yes, it is okay. possible to do that. But you might have to take them out and then put the new ones in and do that. Right. And it does allow you to upload text files. So once you put it all in a text file, you can't import that right into the tip area. So you have to type each one in individually. Chat area, Mr. Elder, sir, has, this is a chance to meet other students, talk about things other than your social, your subject area, a chance to ask questions of individual students, a chance to share, a chance to listen, an opportunity to discover interesting things about your students, a chance to blow off some steam, Chat room, the way he described it, would be a social event. Now, he also has in there that they can ask, a chance to ask questions of individual students. My students in my class decided to run a chat room without me. I wasn't that insulted, but they decided that there was not enough interaction going on in the class. They actually set up at a certain time where you should all get together and talk, and it was a time I couldn't be there. So we ended up having a chat room without me, which is a great social event for the students. It's a great way to find out what the other students are doing in your class. For instance, where they're from, what sports they're involved in, and some of that rapport that we build in a normal classroom, this is a great tool for that. Is there any other activities that have happened? We ran a chat room a few times, Tony, if I remember correctly. Anything you'd like to add to what I just stated? Well, it's a great, great opportunity like being the same <clears throat> to socialize, I guess. We'll be brought students from different classes and over you know, the competition going there between the physics and the English types. Um, um, I guess there's a lot of learning that can take place uh, in the chat rooms as well. Uh, that's how I used it mostly, or I dealt with individual uh, student needs. Okay. Just so very good. But then there was another student that commented that he thought the chat rooms would be too business like. I guess that's a matter of practice. Not social enough. That's a good point. Um, some of the other things that are neat about the chat room, the top four chat rooms are logged. So as a teacher, if I need to talk to a student about, I like the way you did this assignment, one of the chat rooms I was talking about, take them into one of the top four chat rooms. One of them I'm in, in our area we've named as teacher, and then I pull the student into there, I explain to them this is what I think you should do, and at the end of it I go into the log, I cut and paste that as an email to the student, so the student has a record of our conversation. And then it makes it a lot easier for them to follow what was stated in the chat room, otherwise they, they forget, and the, ne the next day they're handing in something that you didn't even ask for. So a lot of times backing your chat room discussions up with an email is a very good habit. Moving right along here. Students quiz, I think it's great because a quiz lets you know how much more you need to learn. I think it's great because there might be material that you have missed for various reasons. I think it's great you can decide which areas need more concentration rather than the whole subject. I think quizzes are the best form of section review. I think quizzes are great because they save time by presenting the material studied in question form. I think quizzes are a great learning tool and they let you know where you are in terms of the rest of the students. So because of the way that quizzes are sat, set up, in a normal classroom, we use quizzes to test material. Now, have we used quizzes in this form of education in a different style? There's a different question for you. That's how I use the quizzes to participate for the other for the purposes. And then the students are not very valuable to realize what they Mr. Coyne, would you call the office, please? Mr. Coyne, please call the office. Yes, that's another comment we want to give back. That is, for every one of the questions, I can make a comment as to what 
area was to work on. Right. And, and they really appreciated that. So it's a good feedback tool. It's a feedback tool. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of learning that takes place as a result. Not only the, I guess we're talking about physics here, but I think the unit test, the design is similar. Of course. Page of chance for mastery learning, too, because of the, the option of setting it one, two, three times, taking it over, you know, that kind of stuff. Definitely. Count your best score, count your middle score, count whatever. I used, oh sorry, I used the quiz differently. Uh, because for English, I had to design open book textbooks, or exams. <coughs> so what I liked was the quiz tool is that I could control the questions that was, uh, would be randomly chosen when the student accesses it. And I was also able to set up a time, fairly flexible time frame. So that a student will write the exam any time during the course of a week and get a different exam than anybody else. Correct. Right. There are pre tests. So a very good example when of course you teach the information process uh, processing. Uh, students come in with a wealth of knowledge, run go through something that they already understand. Um, calculus, which I would be teaching, some of the kids would have a very good grasp of functions. Before we even start, no point in reviewing that if they understand. Just go through the pretest, got it, let's move to the next one. Agreed. Those are all great points. And that, as you started to realize, as we quickly go through all these tools, these tools are as flexible as you want to make them. So you can actually add in all sorts of things, and the more flexible you become, the more interesting some of these tools can be used. And the first thing, the first response we have to any of these tools is a quiz. Okay, a quiz, here's what we used to quiz for in the past. We just simply, here's a question, here's the answer, and be able to use that feedback. Now, would it be possible to set up a whole unit based using just quizzes, where every single page is just a quiz, and all the information is there, and it's sort of fill in the blank type thing. So the, you have to push the limit of these tools a little bit, and you'll find that they are very flexible, and you can do a lot of different things. This next one's a calendar. It allows students to see an overview of the assignments, quizzes and tests, due dates, allows students an opportunity to organize their time or schedules to access the course material as needed, allows students the opportunity to link with key areas of the course, keep students on task so they can finish the course on the time allotted for it. So then, the way Tony has written this down, he's using it as a method of students knowing where they should be at at which time in their course which is the function of a calendar. Is there any other, other positive things that we can use for the calendars? One of the things that I just discovered in the last uh, couple of months was the fact that you can actually put images into the calendar, which is really neat. On the front page or on the page you access? Right on the calendar. You can plug it in there. So at Christmas time, I put Santa with reindeers flying away on the 25th. So then it makes the calendar a little bit more colorful, a little bit more exciting to look at rather than just, oh, Merry Christmas. Now you can have things happen. You can have some animated GIFs in there to make it, things happen right on your screen. The other thing that you can do within it in the calendar is you can link to pages. You can link to quizzes. You can link to a lot of different tools and things right within your course. So then if you have a quiz on a certain day, you can say click on this, and then that can be their access to the quiz. I was talking to a few developers who actually set up their course that way. If you wanted to get into your quiz, you had to go to the calendar and click on that button in order to get to your quiz. So it's just another method of using the calendar. I did have a point for us with some of the uh, due dates, for example, for the labs. So you know, I said to them, okay, this date, so you should be working on the lab, so you know, they would click on there and that would take them to the lab page where they had access to the information that they need. So you can, like you're right, you can make it all the pages in the course if you really want. All right. So it just keeps the students on task. You could also use it as a sub. Not a social thing, but just uh, so that the students get to know each other a little better on every day, the birthday, and things like that. Excellent idea. Okay, we are at this end of step one. We uh, we can take a 10 minute break here. I know we've been sitting and talking a lot, so we'll take a little 10 minute break. I am going to start the stopwatch so you have exactly 10 minutes. To do it. <laughs> Move it, come back at the end of 10 minutes. Can you put this on pause? You have to shut her down. Thank you. So we're all going to be talking. Welcome back. You're one minute late. <laughs> well, we're uh, 
we're going on to the second round here, and we're going to start talking about learning styles. Now, this is a review for most of you. If you remember, we did that uh, seminar way back when where we talked about learning styles. Most of you have already done the, uh, the questionnaire. And what we're going to do is, so first off, the first thing that I'd like you to do is all of you have your questionnaire handouts in front of you. Um, I would like you to come up and using the board pens that I have here, I would like you to write your initials beside where your name is on that chart. So then come on up, it doesn't matter which order, come on up after another and just put your names down. Frankly, if you'd like to follow along, you can take a look at this uh, sheet that you have here, and I will just briefly talk to each one of these different learning styles that you can run across. The first one is the active, reflective. Someone who is active likes to have, likes to do things. That's the way they learn. The reflective is the type of person who likes to sit back and think about it before they actually get into it. The sensing person is a person who likes to learn facts. The intuitive person is someone who likes to discover possibilities and relationships between things. Okay? Someone who's visual, they like to see it. They like charts. They like to have um, overheads put up. They would like to see the actual thing function and blow up on you if you're doing an experiment. So they would like to see the visual end of it. The verbal end of it likes what I'm doing right now where you stand up there, they lecture, they can pick that up. They like to talk things through. They like to hear it. The sequential person likes to do things in a very set formal method. Step one, step two, step three, step four. Global method, show me the end product, I'll figure out how to get there afterwards. Okay, now, no one, as we look at some of these, no one is just this way and not that way. And you'll know active is balanced off with reflective. Someone who is visual is also somewhat verbal. Now, if you take a look at what you see here, there's nine of us in this room. Take a look at the variety of learning styles we have just with the nine people that are here. And what we tend to do in our classes is we teach based on our learning style. Take a look. This is mine. This is the way I think I should teach. And this is the same way I deal with you people. And this is the same reason why I run into problems sometimes with when I'm explaining to Ken. Because Ken doesn't think the same way I do. When I'm explaining something to Sheila, she doesn't grasp it because of the way I explain it. So then as teachers, we have to try to make this apply in the courses. So somehow we need to take a look at this and say, okay, I'm this style. But that doesn't mean I always expect people to have hands-on things. Some people learn better by sitting down and thinking about it. So then we have to make sure our courses reflect that. Now, we're going to go back to our tools. What you're going to do is if you on that overhead, or on your page, your website, Go back into home. So click on home. And we're now on the 210 to the 230. So click on the little guy that says 210, 230. That'll take you into this level. The top icon, which is learning styles, 
shows you a flash application where I took six different students and applied them to a board. And this is exactly the same example that we just showed up here. In those six different students, notice the variety of people that show up there. And if you'd like to see all of them, just click the little green button down the bottom right hand corner. You can see how this is the way the students appeared. This is six different students and myself. So take a look at the wide range of people we have in the, uh, in the out of those six people. You didn't center it, I didn't center it? Oh, well, yeah, sorry. <laughs> The, uh, if you uh, go back one step, yes. At the very bottom is a learning style questionnaire. So if you are showing this to someone and they would like to take the questionnaire to get their where they would be on that scale, then you're welcome to use that. You then also have cut and paste. Click on the cut and paste page. We're going to do a very nifty thing here. What we're going to do is we're going to cut this page right into our tools. So then what I would like you to do is highlight that. Now, the way you highlight something, if you don't know what I'm speaking about here, use your left mouse, start to the left of the L in learning styles, and then drag it across the whole thing. Once you have dragged it across the whole thing, you are then going to cut that. The cut command is control C or control X. Either one will work, but you won't be able to exit either. So control C will just put it into your clipboard on your desktop. Then you're going to exit out of that area. So exit out of that area and open up the discussion. Now we're back into our tools discussion. Click on the one you would like to go to, then that would be your discussion area. So go into main, click on positive. For me, it's a positive presentation area. If I'm looking at whiteboard for Ken Hodson, then I would click whiteboard and then hit reply. When you hit reply, you're then going to paste that and you can paste by control P. Now, did I lose anyone? Control B. Control B. Control B, excuse me. Thank you. So choose one of them, paste it in there. I got to put my name here now. Just hit reply. Should I post it? No, 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 don't post it yet. If it didn't work, what I need you to do is go back to that. Go back to that page, open it up again. Who had problems with this? Okay, I'll come to you in a second. It won't paste? I'll oh, just take it as time away. That's just the speed. discussion area. So you choose whichever one you want, click on it, hit reply. Once you have reply, you'll have this up and running. Then hit control B and that will paste it in there. Now, what I've given you is a generic form. So that generic form, if you hit control V, So this is what you should end up with. Once you have this pasted in there, then what you're doing is the learning styles for my tools. So then if I'm doing the presentation, I would write presentation where that line is. And then you have to decide whether or not it's possible to accommodate the different learning styles. Does the presentation tool allow me to add an active lesson in there? Can I use a presentation tool to do a re reflective type lesson? 
so that the people who are on this side of the learning style can be taught by using the presentation tool. So now what you're trying to do is do the leap from learning styles to the different tools. Is your tool capable of handling the different learning styles? Okay, that's a real big leap. And we'll come back to it in a, little, in a second, but think this through. If I am the presentation tool, can I use it to talk about the visual? Can I use the presentation tool to accommodate this style of learning? Can I use it to accommodate this style of learning? Now, some of the tools have different characteristics. So depending on what your characteristic is, if you're working with the quiz tool, for example, can I use images in the quiz tool in order to write my, have the students write the test? A matching, so is that possible? So then could I fulfill the visual learners using that tool? Is anyone a little bit confused as to what I'm looking for? So you just go down this list and take off the yes or the no based on your decision on whether or not your tool can be used to be active, reflective, sensing, intuitive, visual, verbal, sequential, or global. Is that correctly told in the office? Not yet. Yeah, just get rid of what you don't want. So if you think it will do it, then say yes and take off the no. How you doing? Now, if you need a refresher course on what each one of these elements are, if you have the handout in front of you, feel free to just cruise through that or raise your hand and ask me and I'll come over and help you out. That's what I'm here for. stage, and I notice some of you are finished by the way you're carrying on a conversation, what I'd like you to do then is I'd like you to choose one of the seven different, one of the, excuse me, one of the eight different learning styles, and give me an example of why you said yes or why you said no. So just choose any one you wish, and post in an example. finish that then posts then if you are at the stage where you're a fast hyper and you're finished ahead of everyone rather than carrying on a conversation with somebody next to you why don't you go take a look at some of the other postings that are in the discussion area and reply to someone build that database so 
So for the next little while, if you're finished ahead of everyone else, because we're going to start working at different levels here, then feel free to go in there, read some of the other people's comments, and see if you can add to it, so that we can make this a very useful data bank for us when we're developing our courses. having problems seeing some of your messages when you're in there and you post it, feel free to go in there and hit all messages. Like at the very top of the, the discussion area, you'll see an area that says all messages and then all your messages will appear and you can take a look through some of the ones that are starting to be built here. So at the very top where it says all messages, make sure that you click that so it shows unread as well. At the very top you should Four minutes here before we'll go on. Is anyone running into problems or is everyone just reading some of the postings that are in there? about 10 seconds here and then we will actually 
take a look at one of these just as an example. You can come back and look at all of them after, but for now, I'd just like to visit one of them briefly. Okay. Okay, what I've done, just so that you can take a look at it, is I've taken all the messages that have the word chat in their top message. So this is Dave Elder's area. And what I did is once I ran a search for that, I then selected them all and compiled them. And this is just a, a couple of different actions you're going to go through and I can explain it to you after. What that does, it allows me to read each one of the messages and how they've been responded to and so on. When you're looking for information, this is a great way to read through it. Rather than just clicking next, 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 this is a great way to read through your discussion area because it has all of them in order. It stacks them all up for you, it makes it real easy to read through them. So this is something that you can do later on. I don't want to spend a lot of time because we did do the service, the in-service before about learning styles, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time reviewing this. I'd like to move on to the next area that's called good teaching practices. And that's the one that I think we'll spend a little bit more time on. So if possible, what I would like you to do is go back to home. And we are now on to the 2.30 till 3 o'clock one. Now, in here we're going through exactly the same steps. But before you go any further, what I would like to do is I'd just like to Draw your attentions to this document. This is not something that you've seen before, so this is probably new to most of you. This is the seven principles of good teaching practices. This is, this is written by Dr. James King, and what he has come up with is seven different things that makes a classroom work, or teaching work. So then these are the seven different principles. Most of these, it, for those of us who are teachers in here, most of us have taught 14 plus years in the system. Most of us could probably come up with these seven without a heck of a lot of work. We'd probably add on another 19 on the end of it as to what we think would make a good classroom work. But most of us could come up with these. Just to, uh, to make it a little bit more uh, realistic, I'll go through each one of these and try to give you an example. The first one, principle number one, good practice encourages faculty content contact. If I am a, a good teacher and I am going through behaviors, most of my behaviors should allow the students to have contact with myself. So then I am encouraging the students or making them feel comfortable so that when they approach me, they feel like I am approachable. So then many of my activities or many of my teaching styles should include this in my teaching styles in order to be an effective teacher. The second principle I'm trying to make sure that students are comfortable with each other so that they feel like they could talk to each other and there are areas in my teaching that allow students to interact with each other. The third one is active learning. With the active learning, it's important that students are involved in the teaching. If I stood up at the front and just lectured, for three hours, this seminar, you would have all fallen asleep on me very quickly. So what you try to do is you try to come up with something that will make it a little bit more interesting for the students, a hands-on application. Actually, Ruth would be very attentive. You notice know, this is, you know this from verbal there? Right? Well, that's very true. <laughs> Ruth would have liked it if I just stood up here and talked based on this. <laughs> The next one is the fact that uh, you need to give the students quick feedback. If they wrote an essay, 
and they don't get any response back to that essay for three weeks, and then you come back to it and try to make that a learning experience, it's not going to be. You have to give them feedback as quickly as you possibly can so that they can incorporate that into their lessons and into their style of learning. The next one, make sure they stay on task. For example, bad thing that I did here a few seconds ago is I gave people too long to work on something. These two decided to talk back and forth, so then they weren't on task. So then my actual style didn't emphasize keeping the two students on task. You guys behave, okay? <laughs> you gotta make sure that you are happy, you're, you're on task at all times. The next one, good practice. Make sure that you expect a lot from your students. When I came in here, I could have started with the very basics. This is a chat tool. This is the way you use a chat tool. But you people are way past that. So then what you have to do is you have to make sure you set your lessons at the, to a high expectation. I expect you to be able to reach the standards that I set. Now, realistic high expectations is important. But it is important that you have high expectations. Number seven, make sure that you incorporate this in your lessons. If I just teach to my teaching style, the only people who are going to understand the way I explain things are the ones that are like me. <laughs> Good luck. Okay, so then when I'm talking to someone like Ken, I have to understand that Ken needs to write things down. So then when I'm explaining something to him, he has to write those down. And the same thing goes with each of us. We have our own teaching styles, and some of the people who work exactly the same way I do would have no problems. For instance, our two interns are right into the sequential, okay? And I'm not. I'm so far over here that when it comes down to, well, this is what I want, they're saying, okay, but how do we get there? I'm saying, well, I don't know, but this is what I want. So then you have those problems. So you need to make sure that you take into consideration the fact that we have different learning styles. The second part of that is make sure that you understand that everyone is not going to be a geek. They're not going to be so versed in the computers that if I stood up here and say, okay, click on this, click on this, click on this, and I lose everybody, then I'm not doing a good teaching style. And the same thing happens in all our courses. Now we're gonna do the same thing with these seven teaching principles as we did with the learning styles. We're gonna take the seven teaching principles and we're going to see if they apply to our tool. So based on what I just explained, is it possible to make each one of those apply to your tool? So now we need to go back to this page here, and we have another cut and paste page. And what I've done is I put down in the cut and paste page, here are seven principles. Here they are, one through seven. And you can choose yes or no for each one of those. So then you cut and paste this into a message, making sure across the top you put your tool name. So this is exactly the same as the learning style one that we did. So cut that in. Write them down. Now, steps. You're going to write down yes or no for each one of those, and then you're going to choose one, just like we did the last one. Choose one and explain it. And I'll explain that again as you get closer to that target. So, anyone not know what you're doing with the cut and paste? So you're cut and pasting that in your tools. Yep. Where do I take it to again? Then you go into discussions. Choose one, yep. Yeah. And then hit reply. Reply. Yep. Yeah. Paste right there. You okay? You're up and running? Good. You didn't come. Oh, come. You're right. You okay? Did you lose it, Dave, on the way over? Yep. Yeah. Go back and cut and paste it again.
when you're finished these ones, don't post them, please.